He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Welcome to Orland Park Christian Reformed Church this morning as we gather together to praise the name of Jesus Christ who died and on the third day rose again from the dead, who has ascended into heaven, who sits right now at the right hand of the Father and will return to judge the living and the dead. We stand here today worshiping God for the fact that he makes alive. And we will spend this service praising our risen Savior. As we begin, we get to hear words of God greeting us and welcoming us into this house, the house of the risen God. Let's stand and let's hear God greet us. Grace and mercy and peace be yours from God the Father and from Christ Jesus the Lord. Amen. Amen. As we come into worship by lifting our voices, let's hear this call to worship. It comes from Psalm 57. It says, Awake, my glory. Awake, O harp, and give thanks. I will awake the dawn. I will thank you, Lord, among the peoples. I will sing your praises among the nations, for your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. And let's say all this together. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Amen. Let's lift our voices and worship the King today. I'm from 
come into God's presence and we can sing of the amazing things he's done, we remember that it is his great name, the name above every other name that is seated on high that we lift our praises to. So as we sing this song, would you look upward and see Christ where he is seated before the Father? I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus fled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Single praise and aim. the opportunity now to give of our gifts and our offerings out of the overflow of joy and gratitude that's in our hearts for the risen Lord Jesus. So I'm going to invite the deacons to come on forward now to receive those. Now boys and girls who are ages three through pre-kindergarten, normally you leave at this time for children's church, 
But today you get to stick around a little bit longer because after the choir sings us our offertory, we're going to have a children's message right here on the platform. So boys and girls, stick around. Deacons, come on up and let's have our choir lead us in our offertory.
Well, boys and girls, now it's time for you all to come on up and you can have a seat on these risers here on the platform, boys and girls of all ages, from two to 92. And we have a, I have a brown bag with me. It's a nod to Pastor Dan. Pastor Dan begins with the brown bag. I'm going to finish with the brown bag and place it right here while you all come on up. All right, you can have a seat. It's great to see you all in your bright Easter colors. We have, you guys are really popping. All right, who's got big plans for today? Is anyone going to grandma and grandpa's house? I've been at my grandma's You've been there before? Well, I should hope so. <laughs> now, who here is from out of town? Do we have any visitors? We had some girls from Minnesota in the first service. Anyone from further than Minnesota? Where are you guys from? Where are you guys from? Ooh, Illinois. Okay, so not quite as far as Minnesota. <laughs> gotcha. All right. Now, who of you uh, has done or will do an Easter egg hunt today? Yeah? All right, good amount. What do you guys get in your Easter eggs? What do you find in there? Just say it. Money. Candy, yeah, money. Okay, I like it. Yeah, the first service kids said they didn't get money, so their parents were a little cheaper than yours were. That's all right. I know. I know how it feels. All right. Boys and girls, I hope that you get to enjoy some great time today with your families. I hope you get to enjoy some really good food. And that brings us to my main question for you all. Who here has ever had a resurrection roll? Has anyone made and eaten a resurrection roll before? Yeah, you guys have? Awesome. Okay, well, I have a picture of resurrection rolls for us. This is the unfinished product. Now, let me explain how this works. Now, we take a marshmallow, and we dip it in melted butter, and then we roll it around in cinnamon sugar. Then we put the marshmallow inside that dough for, from a crescent roll, roll it on up, make sure there's no openings or anything like that, and then you put it in the oven, and you bake it for 8 to 10 minutes on 375 or until golden brown, and then you take it out of the oven, and what you have is our next picture when you open up the roll. What does it look like? No yeah, what happens to the marshmallow? It disappears, right? It melts, and then you have something that looks exactly like Jesus' empty tomb, right? Now, these rolls help to tell us the story of Easter, because on Friday night, after Jesus had died on the cross, his friends took his body down and they prepared it for burial with oil and spices, just like we roll the marshmallow around in butter and cinnamon. And then, just like we wrap the marshmallow in the dough and put it in the oven, Jesus, his body was wrapped in grave clothes and it was placed in the grave and it was sealed shut. And just like we wait, only for eight to 10 minutes, for the rolls to be ready, Jesus was in the tomb for three days, and his disciples waited, and they knew that he was really dead. But what happened on Easter Sunday morning? Yeah, Jesus rose again from the dead. Now, question for you, did Jesus melt or disappear like the marshmallow? No, you guys are good. No, Jesus did not disappear. Jesus appeared because he was alive. He appeared to his disciples. He appeared to more than 500 people at once, and they saw him with their very own eyes. And guess what? Jesus is still alive right now, and he's in heaven, and someday you and I are going to get to see him with our own eyes too. Does that sound pretty good? Awesome. All right, let me say a quick prayer for us, and then we can take our seats. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this Easter morning and for the resurrection of your son from the dead. Thank you that we have life in his name when we believe. We pray that you would bless the rest of our service and that we would worship you with all of our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Oh, boys and girls, one more thing. If you want another way to make the Easter story come alive, grab one of these Easter shape kits on your way out of the church today, like as you're going home, because there's Play-Doh in here, and that wants to go in your house, not God's house, okay? 
So, boys and girls, ages three through pre-kindergarten, you can go to Children's Church. The rest of you can find your seats. Great job. Wonderful. Let's stand together and continue lifting our voices in praise. In the darkness we will wait without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin. Let's join in prayer together. Lord and giver of life, we rejoice today in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We praise you that because Jesus conquered death, 
that we have a sure and certain hope that we will live together in your presence. We praise you that because Jesus paid the penalty for our sin, that we can look forward without fear to meeting you, the judge of the living and the dead. We rejoice today in your goodness as we eagerly await the glories of spring. We thank you for these signs of your power to bring new life. As the grass turns green and spring flowers bloom, may our hearts overflow with joy. Fill us with faith in Jesus today. Jesus, whose resurrection guarantees our own glorious resurrection. And if we have suffered some loss, the loss of health, of the financial security of a loved one, we pray that you would grant us the joyful expectation that we will be made whole. Speed the day when all sorrow and sighing will flee away. Speed the day when your new creation replaces the old. We pray today not only for ourselves, we pray for those who long for the final resurrection and the new creation more than any of us ever could. We pray for refugees, for the victims of war, for the survivors of natural disaster, for the abused and exploited. We pray for the homeless and for those disrespected and harmed by prejudice and oppression. We pray for families and communities and nations racked by division and conflict. We pray for those who are persecuted for their faith. Oh Lord God, we see all around us the effects of sin for which Jesus suffered and died. Help us today to believe that this present darkness will end and help us to believe that just as a small seed can sprout and break the rock, that your resurrection will break the sin that has marred your beautiful creation. Make us, O oh Spirit of God, persons in whom the resurrection life already blazes. May our words and our actions be instruments of your healing grace and peace. May the good news of Jesus break up the hard ground of hearts that have been hardened by sin. We pray for all in our congregation who need your healing grace. We pray for your blessing and help for all those who are visiting with us today. We pray for all who need to hear and believe the gospel. We ask that the good and glorious news that Christ is risen may set the tone for our thoughts and our attitudes today and the weeks and days, months and years ahead. We pray this in the victorious name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you turn with me now in your Bibles to John chapter 20? You can find it in the Bibles that are provided for you on page 1077. The words are also going to be on the screen for us. We're going to hear this account of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to hear about his defeat of death. It's a powerful account because it's the apex of the most glorious story ever told. And we get to hear it right now. John chapter 20, I'm going to read the whole chapter, starting at verse 1, reading through the end. Let's remember that this is God's word. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they've laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. The other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. 
Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I'm sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. And put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that by believing, you may have life in his name. I've called this sermon, Hearing is Believing. Before we hear the message preached, would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Our God and our Father... We thank you and praise you because you are good and we worship you today because you are the God who delivers from death. We thank you for this story of Christ's powerful resurrection from the grave. We pray that we would hear and believe and have life even as we are here listening. Let us hear and believe and have life Lord, we pray that you would work in power, that you would create and cultivate belief, true faith within us in Jesus Christ. We pray that you would speak in power in every syllable of this sermon. We pray that you would accomplish your purposes now. Lord, we are here because we desire to know you better and worship you, and we pray that that might happen now. We pray this in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Spirit. Amen. Seeing is believing. That's probably something you've heard, right? It's a statement of of fact, of reality. It's basically become a proverb. When we see things, we believe them. What could be a more convincing proof than, I saw it with my own two eyes? What could be a, a more definitive reality than, I saw it happen? Sometimes when it comes to Easter, if you're anything like me, you think, man... All of the doubts that I have would just melt away if I could somehow go back in time and see Jesus for myself, see him risen, victorious over the grave. If I could just have a look on the face of my Savior, I would believe that would be enough. I've had that thought myself. You might have had that. I know that I'm not alone. I know that that's the case because this week I found out that my kids had found a CD, an old CD of mine. Now, if you're under 20 years old, a CD is an ancient form of media that you could play and listen to songs or sometimes radio broadcasts. They found an old CD of mine. It was uh, called Adventures in Odyssey. This was a program on the radio a long time ago where a proprietor of a snack shop named John Avery Whitaker uh, would teach children about the Bible. And in this episode, he built what's called an imagination station. And one child named Digger went back in time 
to see the Easter week. So we put it into our CD player. If you're under 20, that's how you would play this ancient form of media. You'd play it into a contraption that would actually play songs or media for you. And we listened to it. And in the course of the story, this boy became a Christian by seeing the story play out. I think, man, if I were just able to see it, I'd believe. Maybe you've been there too. And actually, in this passage, John chapter 20, there is a disciple who believes, having seen Jesus, seeing is believing, occupies the last part of John chapter 20. But the message of the chapter as a whole isn't actually that seeing is believing, and that might surprise you given that the word that's repeated again and again and again is saw or looked or seen. All words for having perceived something with the eyes. But the point isn't that, that seeing is believing. Actually, what I want to argue is that the point here in John 20 is that hearing is believing. What I want to plead with you today, what I want to invite you into today is to hear and believe and have life in the name of Jesus. I want you to hear and believe and have everlasting life in Jesus. What we're going to do is we're going to walk through the different scenes that are laid out for us in John chapter 20. The first scene of Mary running to the disciples and them running to the tomb. A second scene where we see Mary back in the garden where the tomb is, where she encounters Jesus. And then a final scene where the disciples see the risen Lord. These three scenes make up John chapter 20. And I want us to walk through them to see what each one of these scenes tell us about seeing and hearing and believing. So let's start with the first scene. The first scene, scene one. The scene that takes us from the room of the disciples to the tomb of Jesus. The passage begins early enough in the morning for it to still be dark. And the focus of the passage, real quick, the repeated word that we'll see again and again and again, shows up in John chapter 20, verse 1. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. She sees that something is amiss. She decides that the only logical thing to do is to run and talk to the disciples, those who were the closest to Jesus during his earthly ministry. They need to know about this, and if they were a part of this, they need to be confronted about this. And so she comes and says to Peter and to John that the, t the stone's been rolled away from the tomb, and they've heard nothing of this, and so they immediately begin to make their way to the tomb. They run there. And it is two disciples. One is named Peter. The other one, we're told, is the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's the way that John, who is the writer of this gospel under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that's the way that he refers to himself. And so Peter and John are running to the tomb. And I can't help but think that John loved to give Peter a little guff because he can't keep himself from telling all of us that he ran faster than Peter. He's like, we all ran to the tomb. I got there first, of course. You know, Peter is old and slow, and so we both ran together. He fell back. I got there first. I love that that shows up in this particular account. Two of us ran. I got there first, of course. And then John looks into the tomb. He doesn't go into it. He looks into it, and we're told that he saw that those linen strips that had been used to go around the dead body of Jesus... He saw them. He doesn't see the body that they were used to wrap, but he sees those linen cloths. And then we see that Peter shows up at the tomb. John can't resist just mentioning one more time that Peter shows up later. And Simon Peter shows up in verse 6, and ever the impulsive disciple, while John had stayed outside of the tomb and looked in, Peter makes his way right in to look around. And Peter sees the same thing. He saw the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head. It's folded up. The other linen strips, the other linen cloths, they're lying there as well. The fact that it's folded indicates that this wasn't something that happened hastily. This happened with intention. And the key thing in all of this is that what the disciples see is absence. 
The men both see linen cloths, but not a body, not the body of Jesus. The purpose of those linen cloths was to wrap a body. The body's gone. In the court system of Israel at this particular time, the testimony of two men who agreed was enough to convict or acquit in court. This testimony of two witnesses, of John and of Peter, was good enough to stand in court. They agree. The body's gone. They saw absence, and that's what they testified to. And in all of the seeing that's mentioned again and again and again in these early verses of John chapter 20, the fact that Jesus is not there is what is essential. That's what's key. He wasn't there. He was risen. And then to make the clearest point in the first scene, we're told that John follows Peter into the tomb. And then what verse 8 says is, then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, again, just wants to remind us, also went in and he saw and believed. He sees that Jesus isn't there. And in the absence of the body of Jesus, he has a sudden intuition that Jesus is alive and he believes. This is before he or Peter even understood from the scriptures that the whole story was all about this. That's what verse 9 says, for as yet they did not understand from the scripture that he must rise from the dead. This was before Jesus or any other disciples came and explained to Peter and to John that this is what the whole book is about from the very beginning of Genesis up to this point, that it's all about the fact that Jesus needed to suffer and die and then on the third day be raised again from the dead. They hadn't connected the scriptural dots yet, but even before that connecting of the scriptural dots, which testify to this reality that Jesus must die and must rise again. John sees the absence of Jesus and believes. You know, if you and I are to believe this morning, it's going to be in the same way. It's going to be in recognizing that we actually don't see the body of Jesus today. That we could go to every tomb in Jerusalem and we could find no body of the Lord Jesus because he is not dead. It's by recognizing his absence and realizing that it's because he was raised from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He sits at the right hand of God the Father that he will return again to judge the earth. It's by seeing that absence and believing that's how we today are saved. If we're to believe today, it will be by seeing that he's not here and believing just like John. And then the camera, if you will, the words of the narrator follow these disciples as they make their way along the path back to the place where the disciples were staying. But the second scene cuts back to the garden where the tomb was. And we see a different character. We see Mary again. Now Mary, as yet, does not believe like John does. She believes that Jesus is still dead. And the pain of loss is deepened terribly because she believes that not only has Jesus lost his life, she believes that she's now lost the body of Jesus. And then a series of astounding things happen. Because of the pain of this loss, Mary stands outside the tomb weeping. And when she looks into the tomb that had just been explored by Peter and by John and found empty, as she looks, she sees that there are two angels occupying this tomb. One near where the head was, where Jesus had been laid, the other at the foot. And what's surprising is that she doesn't stop weeping That when they talk to her, she replies just in a matter-of-fact way to them. This is one of the only instances in Scripture where someone meets an angel and is not overcome with terror or awe. Instead, she keeps weeping. And when she gets asked why she's weeping, she responds with an unspecified they. they. They took his body. I don't know where they put it. She doesn't know who the they are. 
but she can't imagine that Jesus is alive again. It must have been some sinister person or group of people, large group of people that rolled the stone away, that removed the guards, that decided to perform a profane and disgusting prank because the body of Jesus isn't there. And and unbeknownst to her, while she's saying this to the angels, Jesus walks up and he's standing behind her and she turns and she looks at him and she sees him and yet she doesn't actually get it. At first, she doesn't know that it's Jesus. She sees, and at first, she doesn't understand. For Mary, seeing is not believing. She sees him and mistakes him for the gardener. She thinks maybe he's the one that stole the body of Jesus away, or, or at least participated in the crime. She speaks to him in, in at least somewhat of an accusatory manner. She's like, hey, if, if you moved his body, can you just tell me so that I can make it right? so that I could bring it back. We can forget about it, even if you did this thing. Now, isn't that interesting? That she sees him and doesn't understand that it's him? She's actually not the only one. In Luke chapter 24, we're told the story about two disciples who are walking with Jesus on the road to Emmaus. They actually don't understand. They see Jesus and don't understand that it's him. What's amazing is that even if you and I had the capacity or the capability to go back in time and to witness the resurrection, we might see and not get it ourselves. Isaiah says that Jesus had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. There was nothing in his form that we should desire him. It may be that even if we had the capacity to go back in time and see Jesus that we might not understand. It might not work out for us like the kid in Adventures in Odyssey. Mary doesn't understand until something particular happens. She actually doesn't understand who Jesus is until she hears him speak her name. Mary. And it's in hearing him speak her name that she understands. It's at that moment that she cries out and embraces him. Rabboni. When she hears her name, she understands. In Isaiah chapter 43, God says this about his own people. He says, but now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. If you and I are to believe this morning, it will be in the way that Mary does. By having the Holy Spirit tune our ears so that we can hear the Lord Jesus speak our name. And in hearing, believe and understand that he has redeemed us, called us to himself, that we are his through the ears of faith. We can hear the risen Jesus speak right now in his word and realize that he is alive and we are his. And then there's a final scene. And in this final scene, it's the one place where we actually do get seeing is believing. Jesus appears to his disciples and they see him and they believe And they tell it to another disciple, the one that wasn't there, Thomas. Now, Thomas is a strict rationalist. He hears the message that Jesus is alive, and he won't believe it, even from these fellow disciples 
who he would have lived with and would have trusted. He doesn't believe the message that Jesus is alive. I mean, it's an extraordinary message if you think about it. And Thomas says, no, 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 no. I'm not going to believe just based on hearing. I have to see in order to believe. And Jesus is so gracious and loving to Thomas. One of the things that you'll note if you read the end of the Gospel of John is God is amazingly gracious to Thomas in a couple of different places. This is one of them. So Jesus comes back and he stands among the disciples again and he says, Thomas, you won't believe unless you see me, unless you put your fingers in the nail holes that the, the nails ripped in me. Well, we'll do that. And stop your doubting and believe. And because our Savior is so gracious, he lets Thomas see so that he might believe. And Thomas, to his credit, understands. And Thomas, to his credit, gives such a clear declaration of the nature of our Redeemer. Do you see what happens to Thomas when he sees? Thomas, in verse 28 of our chapter, Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Thomas, because of the grace of Jesus, is able to identify the fact that this Jesus, risen from the dead, is Lord and God and testifies to that reality. But actually, there's one more word that Jesus has. Thomas, you've seen me and you believe good. But I want you to know those who are blessed. Those who believe because they've heard the message. Not just seen. Blessed are those who haven't seen and have yet believed. At the very end, even in this moment where there's seeing and then believing, Jesus commends those who have believed even without seeing. And so if you and I are to believe this morning, it actually won't be in the way that Thomas believed. It won't be by seeing Jesus, unless he does a great miracle. But ordinarily, it won't be by you and I seeing Jesus like Thomas did. And what John 20 says is that's actually a blessing. If you've been given the ears of faith to hear the message and believe, that is a great blessing. You are blessed. Jesus himself, the risen Lord, says you are blessed if you've heard and you believe. And at the very end of our passage, John chapter 20 John, the writer of this gospel who wrote, empowered by the Holy Spirit of God, actually just lays it all on the table. He tells us why it is that he even compiled this account. And it's for the purpose of believing. Do you see the way that this whole passage concludes? Let me just read these two verses, verses 30 and 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. If you and I are to believe this morning, it will be by seeing that the tomb is empty and believing. It will be by hearing with the ears of faith and believing. It will be by experiencing the blessing of belief without seeing. And so as we conclude, let me plead with you to hear and to believe and to have everlasting life in Jesus. Let me mention just one more Bible verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. As we look 
not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Don't look to what is seen. Listen. Because the message of Easter morning 2,000 years ago resounds throughout all of history. He's alive. He is alive. He is alive. He is alive. It is the cry of the church of the risen Lord. And it will be what we testify to throughout the rest of eternity. He is alive. That is the message that I have for you today. Hear it and believe and experience everlasting life. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we pray that having heard your word read and preached, that we might believe and that by believing that we might have life in the name of Jesus. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we go from this place, we go with the blessing of the living God going with us. So would you stand Would you hear the closing blessing that comes from God? We'll conclude our time by singing praise to our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus. And as we go, we'll go with his blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.
in his presence today.